further ado, I will um, invite Claire to, um, to kick off. Thanks very much, Vicky. Uh, right, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Has that worked? Yep, I can see it. Fantastic. Uh, yes, so as Vicky said, I'm Claire Donovan and I'm the campaigns manager for End Furniture Poverty. So I'll just start by quickly explaining who we are, what furniture poverty is, and then move on to the uh, results of the research project. Um, so we, we're part of a group of registered charities and 100% not-for-profit social businesses, which include Bulky Barbs, FRC and Buckingham Interiors. All of our businesses either create social impact or help to raise funds for the group as a whole to create social impact. And M Furniture Poverty is here to raise awareness of furniture poverty and to help to develop national solutions to furniture poverty. It really helps us that we've got that expertise and resource of our wider organisation to draw on when needed as well. We do all sorts of things from publishing guides to help people to find essential furniture items to the research reports we've published looking at the furniture tenancy provision and social housing. And we've got a report being published next week uh, looking at furniture provision through local welfare assistance schemes. We also write articles, run campaigns and do things like this, presenting to different groups to raise awareness of, uh, of furniture poverty. So what is furniture poverty? This is our definition. It's the inability to afford or access basic furniture, appliances and furnishings that provide a household with a socially accepted standard of living. And all parts of this definition are important. It's about being able to afford or access. So it's not just about being able to afford to purchase the furniture. You, you might be able to access it through local schemes or family and friends. And it's about the ability to participate in the norms of society. So it's not just about the physical lack of furniture. It's about what this means in practice. So not being able to have friends around, not being able to cook and prepare a meal, not being able to host your child's birthday party, for example. And we see furniture poverty very much as a continuum. There are varying degrees. At one end, we have furniture insecurity, where a household has everything they need for now. But if something breaks or needs replacing, they won't have the savings to do this and could move into furniture poverty. And at the other end, we've got furniture destitution, where a household has none or very few of the basic items they need. And we see furniture po poverty as a chronic problem. It's not an acute one. So if, if someone is in furniture poverty or furniture destitution, providing them with the furniture that they need is a great start, but it's not going to make all of their problems go away. The issues are usually much more complex. However, it can help them to get into a position where they can start to face those other problems and reach out for support. So we have started working much more closely with a wide range of organisations to help to develop more comprehensive solutions to furniture poverty. Um, sorry, Claire, are you able yes. to move your slides on? Because I think we can just see the first one. Oh, you're joking. I'm moving them along. Can't you see them? Uh, no, I can't. Um, okay. If you do um, slide, if you if you go into slideshow, does that not, does it not? Um... I'm in slideshow now. Oh. Do you think perhaps it might be? Um... What I could do is I could um, try and share my screen potentially. Um, that could, with your slides on, that might that might work. Okay, Unless... you could do that, please. Um, let me see if I can do that. Um... Sorry, I'm just trying to, might, I'll just um, try and work out the technical thing. <laughs> you, you might want to just, just uh, keep talking for a while. I'm just trying to see if I can do that. So, uh, well, I'll, 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 t I'll talk on slide four and hopefully okay. you can see it soon. <laughs> okay. Slide four is a list of uh, the, what we call the essential furniture items. And in order to refine our understanding of furniture poverty and to provide our campaign with a practical foundation, uh, in 2016, we opened a consultation with the aim of creating a list of essential furniture items, including white goods that we believe everyone in our society should be able to afford or access. And the list includes uh, beds and bedding, uh, table and chairs, sofa and or easy chairs, wardrobe slash chest of drawers, floor coverings, window coverings, 
washing machine, refrigerator and freezer, cooker slash oven and a television. So if someone doesn't have one or more of these items and doesn't have the means to obtain them, we class them as living in furniture poverty. We know some of these items are more controversial than others, such as the television. But for an elderly person who can't get out, the television can be their only company. And certainly during lockdown, I'm sure we've all appreciated our televisions. And it's about the four slack. So some people may choose not to have a television, uh, but of course that doesn't mean they're living in furniture poverty. Sorry, Claire, I'm having, I'm having problems actually accessing my screen. So <laughs> I'm not doing too well today. Um, you might, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know when I manage to find it. Okay, perhaps if we share the presentation afterwards as well. Yeah, we can do. Okay, so next slide is the financial impact, the poverty premium. It's very expensive to live in furniture poverty. Living without a cooker and relying on microwave or takeaway food can add £2,100 to the average family annual food bill, which is twice as expensive. Uh, living without a washing machine, having to use a laundrette can add £1,000 a year to an average family's washing expenses which is two and a half thousand times more expensive. And we believe that these figures are from a year ago, over two million households, 4.8 million people are living without at least one essential uh, appliance. And uh, we expect there'll be thousands and thousands, if not millions more, uh, given the impact of, of COVID. So our furnished tenancy research, uh, the report's called No Place Like Home and it's available on our, on our website. And the report examines why, the, why are there so few furnished tenancies in the social housing sector? What furniture support is currently available? And what impact can increased furniture provision have, to li have on the lives of tenants? We really wanted to understand why there are so few furnished tenancies in the social housing sector compared to the private rental sector. Only 2% of social rented properties are less furnished or partially furnished such as floor, curtains, uh, floor coverings or curtains, in comparison to 29% of private rented properties. And we just wanted to find out what supports out there and what could increased furniture provision mean for tenants, or inversely, what's the impact of the current lack of furniture provision uh, having on tenants. So we started the research by consulting our FT working group uh, and conducting a survey of RSL staff, which helped us shape the project in its early stages. And then we carried out interviews with social landlords and tenants living in the social housing sector, and also under top quantitative analysis of large data sets. I think. Any? Yeah, sorry. I think There's lots I of information found on my it. I know, I think I found it. Here we go. So, can everyone yeah. see that now? Yeah. So, do you want me to move oh, that on? Perhaps just go, go up to the top, Vicky, and just, just whiz through the slides I've covered just so people can see. I think particularly the furniture poverty ladder. Yep, so, and furniture poverty. Uh, so this is the furniture poverty ladder we talked about. Um, furniture in insecurity leading on to furniture destitution. Uh, the next slide is that list of essential furniture items. And then some figures from the, the poverty premium on the next slide. Um, and then uh, uh, if you can move, move on to slide seven, please. Next one. Next one, please. Yeah. Right. Next one. So to, thank you so much. Uh, right. So to begin with, why is this all so important? We began our report by setting the scene to understand and demonstrate why we believe this support is so necessary by examining how many social housing tenants are living in poverty, why they're living in poverty and what support is currently available. Furniture poverty, along with food and fuel poverty, is ultimately about poverty. Uh, but we can't see these in isolation. They're all direct consequences of a society which unevenly distributes well. A society where, despite GDP growth, has 19.6 um, million people living below the minimum income standard. And again, these figures are all pre-pandemic. So the latest in, uh, research indicates this figure is going to increase to 21.7 million by May 21. Uh, next slide, please. So the key findings, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so this part two of our report presents our findings from the interviews and the findings are a reflection of the most commonly identified themes. And of course, we included dissenting views and counterclaims to make sure we fully explored every topic. And furniture poverty, we've long campaigned for the provision of furnished tenancies and social housing, but we genuinely did approach this report in a completely unbiased way. 
and we've aimed to pre present a genuine reflection of what supports out there, the barriers that exist, and try to identify solutions. And these are the findings. So I'll go through them all one by one. Next slide, please, Vicky. So finding one, this was largely drawn from our tenant interviews, although our social learner participants also had a lot to say about the potential effects of furniture provision. It sounds really obvious to say that furniture provision has a positive effect on the lives of tenants, but it's also important to state uh, to, to state this, but also to examine what the effects are. And it's around tenants' mental health, their financial security, and their physical and social well-being. Next slide, please. So there was broad agreement uh, across our interviews with both tenants and social landlords about the positive impact furniture provision can have on the reduction of debt and rent arrears. With cuts to social security over the past decade, trying to manage day-to-day -day living is hard enough on benefits, let alone trying to put money aside, to pay for furniture or white goods. Trying to do so can leave tenants without enough money for food, uh, fuel or rent. And our research shows that for people on low incomes or those relying on benefits, there are few options beyond crisis grants or furnished tenancies which don't reduce their disposable income. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, furniture provision and mental health. We heard many stories from both tenants and landlords about the damaging effect furniture poverty can have on their mental health and well-being, and also how the provision of furniture can help with mental health. One tenant who has a furnished tenancy said it's so comforting to know that you've got a furnished place to call home. For someone fleeing domestic violence, for example, already suffering with mental health issues, it's unimaginable that they should move into an empty box. This quote on the slide is one from, a, is what, from one of the RSL participants uh, who said that a lot of their customers come into the property with nothing and the impact that that can have. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Vicky. So I'm just, it's just uh, playing up a bit for some reason. <laughs> Honestly, if, 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 if all the technical things could go wrong that have, they, I think they have. <laughs> Thank Fantastic. you. Uh, so furniture provision, social well-being and social exclusion. We spoke to tenants who feel they can't invite their family and friends around to visit them because of their lack of furniture. Two of the tenants we spoke to were parents who hadn't seen their children for a while because of the lack of furniture. And it can also mean tenants are less likely to invite support workers into their home, uh, those who could help them with other issues in their lives, which means they could be missing out on vital support. And this issue of stigmatisation came up a lot too, people feeling that they were being judged for their lack of furniture, parents feeling that their lack of furniture made them feel like bad parents. So it really does have a huge impact. Next slide, please, Vicky. So our second finding was looking at the current provision that's out there and we found that there was a patchwork but it, they were generally uh, ge generally inadequate options. This is a mixture of the um, options for both RSLs and for tenants. Um, our interviews with social landlords confirmed our understanding of the support that's available and also how inadequate it is. Some of the options listed here uh, you can see refers to local welfare assistance schemes, uh, refer to the grant giving charities etc. Uh, but some of them take considerable staff time to complete applications and some can mean the tenant can be waiting for weeks or longer for items or not receive items at all if applications are not successful. Um, RSL participants without a furnished tenancy uh, offer said that they struggle to help people with furniture. It's often ad hoc and as one of them said it's reactive rather than strategic. Another said that they, they have staff donations but unexpected, you know, unsurprisingly this is unable to sufficiently meet demand. The tenants that we spoke to uh, try to get donations from family and friends, they try to save money from benefit payments, moderate to high interest credit, which can obviously leave them in, in debt and unable to pay their rent and afford food. Um, and the option, of course, furnished tenancies, but this was in the, in a minor, in the minority by a significant margin. Uh, next slide, please. So finding three, we looked at the barriers preventing more furniture provision in social housing, and these were the, the, the main barriers that, that, that we came across. A general lack of understanding and awareness of how an FT scheme would work, including relevant government policy. Um, and this was particularly around a lack of understanding about the service charge uh, eligibility. So uh, furniture is, is eligible to be covered through the service charge element of both housing benefit and universal credit. Um, the tenant can never own the items. The furniture has to remain the property of the landlord. 
uh, but it is an eligible cost and many social landlords didn't didn't seem to understand didn't seem to be aware of this. Um, we know that RSLs have been under significant financial pressures in recent years, but our interviews showed that for those running schemes, actually an F FT scheme can generate you know, significant profits, to be honest, but that does take time. Um, the positive impact on tenancy sustainability, reducing void costs, uh, and the FT scheme, of course, can reduce tenant debt and therefore improve rent arrears. So there are some real financial benefits to the creation of the scheme. Everyone we spoke to agreed that top-down support is vital for an FT scheme to get underway. Um, but there was a real change in attitude as so many RSLs are now recognising uh, that too many of their tenants are, are living in furniture poverty. And we, are, we will, of course, do what we can to turn that attitude change into the creation of FT schemes. Next slide, please. So the last point on that was the poverty trap. And there was a real, um, uh, quite strong views from people who didn't provide uh, furnished tenancies about this notion of a poverty trap. Um, the non-FT providers saw it as a real issue, said it could deter people from moving into employment because they'd be worried about affording the service charge if they came off benefits. However, the FT providers that we spoke to said, so long as there's sufficient flexibility embedded within a scheme, it's not a significant problem. And this means flexibility with regards to uh, allowing a tenant to return items if they later enter work to reduce the service charge. And this gives the tenants the ability to buy their own items piece by piece while gradually reducing the service charge. We know this isn't easy for an RSL to navigate embedding that flexibility uh, while still ensuring that the scheme is financially, financially viable, but it's certainly not insurmountable as many of the FT providers we spoke to demonstrated. And we're going to publish some more guidance uh, to specifically looking at the flexibility in the coming months. But I do think it's also important to recognise that there's a cohort of tenants who realistically will always remain on benefits. And for these people, a furnished tenancy can be an ideal solution to furniture poverty. We also spoke to tenant participants, participants about the poverty trap argument, and overwhelmingly they did not consider this to be an issue. As the first quote shows on the slide, um, Tina was particularly um, angry, to be honest, about the, the idea of a poverty trap. While the number of items uh, people would want from a furnished tenancy varied, there was cons consensus across all tenant participants that they would at least want to be given the option of renting a furnished tenancy. And, and in fact, some of the tenants said that trying to find a job when you live in an empty box is just too hard. So a furnished tenancy actually helped them to find employment, the opposite of a poverty trap, not being able to wash clothes for job interviews, the feeling of hopelessness and lack of energy that comes from living without essential furniture can make it extremely hard to motivate yourself to find a job. And those in furnished tenancy said that the knowledge of having a secure furnished home made such a difference to their attitude and happiness, it helped them to move into employment. Of course, we know this won't be the case for everyone, but certainly for some that we spoke to, it was a real positive effect. Next slide, please. And then the final finding was uh, furniture provision is likely to improve uh, tenancy sustainability. And the reasons behind this are closely related to the positive benefits presented in finding one, that ability to rest, wash your clothes, a reduced feeling of stigma and the ability to be more financially insecure because they haven't had to borrow furniture, uh, borrow, borrow at high interest rates to acquire furniture, for example. And this finding complements a plethora of other reports, which have also suggested that the provision of furniture can improve tenancy sustainability. For one tenant we spoke to, uh, they said for people, that's where it all goes wrong. If you've got to start going into finance and loans to furnish the place, they can't keep up payments on the rent. And that's why a lot of people get evicted. One of the RSL participants said who provides a furnished tenancy scheme that if someone stayed in the property for another six months, then you've got an extra six months rent and you've saved two and a half thousand on a possible void. Organisations organizations need to get away from the concept that it's a financial risk. Next slide, please. So the report, as I say, is, is available on our website and obviously there are some recommendations in there. So the recommendations for social landlord is we'd, we'd like um, RSLs to consider appointing a furnished tenancy champion. And this would be someone within the organisation who takes ownership of pushing the agenda forward, raising understanding and under awareness of furnished tenancy schemes and how they can be delivered, including understanding the service charge. We'd like these FT champions to register with us, partly so we can gauge the impact of our work, but mainly so it commits them to fully exploring the provision of furnished tenancies, and it means that we can help and support them on that journey. We'd like uh, RSLs to survey tenants, to listen to what they have to say and to hear their views on FTs. Um, and we want RSLs to recognise the benefits that we've outlined here, the benefits of a furnished tenancy scheme on both tenancy sustainability and the lives of their tenants. 
And of course, ultimately, we want them to establish a furnished tenancy scheme and ensure that the impact of the scheme on the lives of their tenants, in addition to uh, tenancy sustainability and financial elements are measured and monitored. They can then use this data if they want to grow or expand a scheme. But we'd also like them to uh, use this data to encourage others to consider an FT scheme by showing them how successful and impactful one can be. Next slide, please. So our recommendations for, for the government, um, we've already started conversations with the DWP uh, and we're hoping to speak to other departments in, in the coming weeks and months. We'd like the government to provide clarity for social landlords with regards to the eligibility of furniture as a service charge and the amounts that are permissible. We found there could be somewhat of a postcode lottery uh, depending upon which benefits office or UC hub that, that um, RSLs approached. There could be some uh, disparity between uh, particular items that were allowed and the levels of service charge that they would permit. In an ideal world, we'd like them to provide financial support for social landlords with insufficient capital to enable them to establish an FT scheme and even to consider incentives uh, for those looking to create a scheme. We'd like them to provide updated guidance to their local benefits offices and UC hubs on the setting of service charge levels, again, to ensure that there's that geographically even framework and it's not a postcode lottery. And then in terms of that overall furniture provision, and we go into this much more in our report looking at um, local welfare provision uh, next week, we'd like them to reintroduce adequate ring fence funding for local welfare assistance schemes, provide updated guidance and support to local authorities to ensure local welfare provision is more geographically even um, and fair, and um, do sign up to our mailing list on our website to receive a copy of, of that report. Uh, next slide, please. And then what we're going to do, uh, we're producing a, there is a guide on how to create a sustainable FT scheme on our website, but we're going to produce, a, we're in the process of producing a much more detailed guide, um, which goes through some of that, those flexibility uh, options uh, that I mentioned earlier. We're also putting together some information sheets, which we hope will be of use to the FT champions to clearly explain the eligibility of furniture provision through the service charge, the benefits of tenants' wellbeing and tenancy sustainability. Uh, and we're also going to publish uh, a register of FT champions to acknowledge the organisation's uh, support, uh, the commitment to supporting their tenants through the provision of furniture. We are here to provide support to RSLs with measurement and evaluation methodology of FT schemes. We're already developing this and working with several housing associations who are looking at new schemes. We're doing a webinar with uh, Chartered Institute of Housing in May. Uh, looking at uh, furnished tenancies and going through uh, preparing a business case, uh, staffing requirements, etc. Um, and we're also putting together some more detailed case studies with RSLs who run FT schemes. We've got one with Taurus on our website already. We're doing a much more detailed one with them. We've got a great one with Stockport Homes Group, which we're going to be publishing uh, in the next couple of weeks. Next slide, please. And then finally, we're here. So please do. Uh, get in touch with us. Um, we're always happy to talk uh, to do, to anyone to provide support, to provide help, and to give more information about our work. So please do get in touch. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you, Claire, um, and thank you for persevering through the the, um, the slide sharing uh, issues. Um, really interesting. I think it's really interesting points about um, you know the damaging mental effect uh, and positive. Health and well-being effects of having a having a, um, a furnished tenancy. Um, so yeah, really excellent. Um, and as I said, we'll uh, be able to ask some questions of Claire um, uh, at the end. Uh, but now we're moving on to Peter, uh, Peter Gale from Citizen, who's going to share his experience uh, at Citizen of of their new uh, Fresh Start pilot scheme. Morning, everyone. I'm going to talk to you about our Fresh Start pilot what the drivers for change were and our approach and a bit about our learning so far. Um, but just a bit, a bit of a, a health warning is that we're still going through the pilot, so we don't have lots of firm outcomes, but I will share with you what we've already um, pulled together. And also just a, a, another health warning is that we were, we were due to ramp up a much bigger project this last year, but the pandemic came along and we had to do a much a smaller scale. But um, we are going ahead this year, this post-April, with a, with, a, with a significantly larger um, a, a scheme. For those of you who don't know us, we are based in the West Midlands. We've got 30,000 units. And we're, our main operational areas are in Coventry, 
um, Birmingham and Hereford and Worcestershire. And it doesn't look as if it likes, wants to me to move on my slides either. Oh yes, it does. So if I go that way. So um, in, let me start back in, in sort of in 2018, our journey to becoming citizen, we, we sort of identified that our current relet standard presented our organization with significant human and business challenges to our future identity as a sustainable and people-centered business. Like many associations over the years, our standards have been pared back considerably in order to reduce our costs. And perversely center benchmarking presented low, low void investment as an indicator of high performance, which I think blinded the sector to the wider implications for our legitimacy including the long-term reputation and financial risk for us as a sector. As you'll appreciate, most of our customers come from one form of homelessness or another. The, the allocations restrictions we now work within with social housing acute shortage means that those that we let to are least able to refuse poor quality properties. This in itself places a significant responsibility on us as an ethical landlord and to understand the impact of this standard on our customers. Initially, our assessment of the need was highly emotional, as you'd expect, with a strong sense of a human level that this approach was neither right, ethical or appropriate. However, we decided to research the wider hypothesis that our current approach was also impacting on us commercially and to recalibrate the definition of our void standard from the perspective of customer, not sector standards. Our current business metrics for voids have remained stubbornly static for a number of years. We currently turn over stock across our portfolio at the average of approximately 7% a year. However, the key geographies, the stock types, this is much higher with bed sits and one bedroom accommodation turning over the rates of 16% and 10% respectively. Our current void loss is driven disproportionately by flats and bed sits, as I mentioned, as well as the low impact of, of some retirement living properties. Despite a shortage of social housing, many properties still receive multiple refusals at the point of letting, with this often being down to property standard and, and where the location of where it is. For us, bed sits refuse, um, still have the highest refusal with 49% against an average across the other portfolio of 36%. And the average number of refusals on bed sits is twice that of any of the property types. During our initial customer research, it was very clear that many people were shocked at the condition of our properties, the mental health impact of moving into accommodation that was not decorated or carpeted was noted as very significant with almost all customers expressing their mental health deteriorated after moving into one of our properties because of the stress of trying to make it habitable with limited resources. The lack of decoration, carpet and white good was noticed by many customers as something which had driven them into debt and subsequently to struggle to pay their rent. The lack of access to a washing machine has always been already mentioned. We, we did a, a piece of study and on average, we thought a single customer was paying, told us they were paying about 1200 pounds a year just in laundry expenses. Our staff or voids teams were also expressed significant frustration at the standard, stating that it was demotivating to have to provide such a minimal offer and that they knew they were leaving properties that still had repair requirements at the point of relet. The impact of this minimal level of current repair was also borne out in our customer satisfaction and contact statistics post move in with 93% of relet properties requesting other repairs and 30% of all complaints being generated from new tenants about the relet standard. No, it's a bit too fast. Uh, we started our journey to re re redefine our offer in May 2019. We engaged the innovation company What If to help us as part of our wider transformation on becoming citizen and the desire to learn from other sectors. What If worked with commercial companies to generate ideas and help them bring them to the market. We were keen to learn about their alternative innovation and exper experimentation methodologies, and we created a project team to work alongside them. The first task we, we did with them was about sorting out our business and human centric problem statements which form the basis of our research. And they're clear to see on the slides that our first one was about our business, was making sure that we developed an ethical, viable sector leading relet product that will support faster letting, greater customer satisfaction, reduction in churn for us, increased average tenancy length, reduction in post void dissatisfaction and further work. 
The human challenge, as I already mentioned, was about generating that long-term positive relationship with us as a landlord. And to get away from this relet moment just being about a transactional uh, exchange to make it a much more empowering and aspirational experience. So we started on a two month intensive development stage uh, and then we wanted to test the most suitable solution to the problems identified. As previously mentioned, what if introduced us to new methods and techniques? During the solution, solution development stage, we worked intensely with customers, experienced the current standard to understand what the impact had on their service experience and the sustainability of their tenancy. We wanted to understand the real needs of tenants and we ran in person uh, immersions with 12 current and future tenants, spending time with them in their homes. We witnessed viewings at the moment from handing over keys and spoke to people waiting for a home. And we also, to follow the ever-changing ever situations and emotions that new tenants experience, we also ran digital diaries with 16 tenants so they could virtually give us a virtual live um, update. We also gathered raw and filtered emotions and behaviours over four days through video blogs, daily diary questions, photo uploads, and this provided a real rich insight to the intricate lives of our tenants and their exposure and experience when moving into our, our homes. Throughout this stage, the, we, um, the team were creating lots of ideas and we had up to 50 different ideas to try and solve the relay challenges, but obviously we couldn't deliver all those. So the selection of the final three ideas that we chose to take forward in the formal piloting, we had, they, had to, they had to deliver three tests or undergo three tests. The first was the direct test on our commercial challenges. It had to, had to, to, to lower our costs ultimately or to drive and in driving um, satisfaction. The second was our right to win as an organization to deliver the solution. We didn't want to do it if someone else was doing it or if another agency was responsible for doing it. And the final um, test for us was the degree that the solution would address the significant customer pain point during the lettings process. So we went on to develop a prototype relet offer that would empower our repairs team with more time and money to raise the void standards so we could give our tenants a fresh start. We hope the higher upfront costs will be in part funded by driving future cost savings from reduced rent loss due to shorter void periods, less turnover, less follow-up repairs, less claims from delayed repairs such as leakage or, um, you know, uh, and reduced complaints and fewer call center volumes. The three solutions that were identified with customers and staff through the process form what we call the fresh start standard, which was a professionally refurbished home that's a blank canvas that allowed someone to put their own personal touches. It was neutrally decorated, a deep clean, all the repairs were completed with the provision of flooring throughout. We also had a, a second one was a fresh start repair solution, a digital solution for the repairs team to drive insight, feedback and improvement in the application to, to tell us how they were delivering the new standard. This would include the ability to rate and rank performance and provide a remote solution to surveying, allowing quality checking to a high level at the point of relet. I say this insight would be central to the future value of re-engineering the new void standard. And finally, the essentials, a solution to offer tenants access to affordable furniture and white goods at the point of letting. We made a number of assumptions of the financial and customer experience levers these three solutions would create in our business and developed our first stage commercial uh, cost model. At this point, we took uh, the, uh, the executive through the detailed pilot process case to gain their buy-in so we could progress to the next stage uh, and we could start to test the assumptions of the real world in, real, real world, world in order to de-risk the model. Following this sign-off, we commenced uh, stage two, and it, which was an intensive two-month period where we ran a pilot of 10 voids in real time to test out our assumptions about the impact the fresh, guarantee, fresh start guarantee would have on our customers and the business. So we tested three different relet specifications to understand the relative impact of the different elements of the proposition. The first one was called looks great. And that was a property being freshly decorated with new flooring. The second specification was called costly essentials and that provided new kitchen appliances and new flooring throughout. And a third we, we called the all in and that had appliances, new flooring and was completely decorated. We wanted to offer fresh start to people that were most in need. So we focused on our bed sit and bed, one bed properties in 
Coventry, where, where we had a high correlation with this customer group, and the proposal was, uh, was developed with, the with 10 customers we identified. This trial was subsequently extended to a further 70 customers from November 2020, and we'll talk more about the specifications and the bigger project later on. The second pilot confirmed some aspects of our assumptions, but also intended some wider challenges that we needed to test further. And we, that we had a behavioral insights team uh, work stream that went on that clearly evidenced that during the pilot phase, the new standard had considerable impact on customer satisfaction and a reduction on the potential future service demand. I'm now gonna give you some statistics and I apologize that it's, it's a bit, bit heavy, but we'll, we'll make sure that we can share those outside. So for example, 24% of our customers who were getting our normal voids um, were, were very impressed with the property when they were shown compared to 80% of those in the new Fresh Start group. 38% of those viewing the current standard were actually dissatisfied with the standard compared to none with the new standard. 41% of customers viewing the existing standard were dissatisfied with our standard flooring offer. None of the customers with the new standard were dissatisfied, surprise, surprise. 50% of customers viewing our standard voice throughout thought their void properties would need more repairs compared to none. So again, as you can see this collective picture that people were seeing that the fresh start was really making a difference. And 66% um, of customers told us they thought the offer represented good value. And the same number agreed a scheme like this would make moving to a new house easier. We recognized this was a small sample and that this offer needed further work, especially to deliver an affordable white good offer. An initial work suggested the offer could cost approximately £8.67 a month per white good delivered via a rental or a lease agreement with, a, with an identified provider. In addition to the value this new standard offers to customers, we also mentioned the improved job satisfaction and engagement of staff in the voids process, and the results were very clear. The move to the new standard drove an increase in sta staff satisfaction from approximately 50% under the old standard to 100% of the lettings team being really satisfied in their role under the new standard. Staff also were happy to, to recommend it to their families. And again, it was clearly the pride generated in our services by the two different standards uh, was very clear as, as 8% of staff were very proud of the current offer compared to 78% under the new offer. So again, a clear indication that people felt the difference. Obviously the 10 tests were used we used to develop the revised financial modeling of Fresh Start standard, and we created a number of quality standards in the pilot process and based our final assumptions on that highest additional cost, these, and these are shown in the tables. Uh, and so far, these assumptions have, have broadly proved accurate, you know, the, the, within, the, within, the, um, within the remit of the figures on the, on the, on the slide. A fuller evaluation to, de to further de-risk the solution as much as possible uh, uh, and given the need that we need to factor in additional property condition repair costs are still to be completed and we, and we hope to have a more defined um, uh, evaluation uh, during May of this year. During the pilot, one thing we did identify, as I mentioned, was the, uh, was the repair standards. In fact, the total cost of repairs, once all the repairs were completed, showed that our current standard on average was only addressing around a third of those repair costs that were actually required. And um, we believe this potentially reflected the significant under investment we were putting into voids. The pilot also identified the need to change one of our financial mitigation assumptions from the first stage. We assumed it would be viable to serve this charge for carpets or flooring to a customer as this was technically possible. Uh, we did undertake extensive legal advice which identified that this would create long-term liabilities with the service charge model and will place us uh, and so we decided then to change our assumptions and just decided to gift carpets at the beginning of the tenancy. We also sought to estimate the potential final effect of any long-term void repair times. I, did it take longer? Uh, and how did that play off against the reduction in the void loss from reduced re refusals? And based on the outcomes for custom immersions, we calculated the void loss impact was essentially netted off to zero. So the faster letting time meant that we re uh, that, um, took or we mitigated the, the repairs costs, the actual additional costs. And this obviously needs, needs to be tested and strengthened with the larger, with the larger rollout of the, of, the, um, of the scheme. So what did we do next? 
Given the high potentially unknown levels of the cost of repairs, which we've mentioned, we needed to run this a much larger pilot during 2020 in order to build up more robust business case. Uh, we knew in the long term, the greatest financial lever to reduce the cost model would be the reduction in churn and eventually lower the average void costs from both uh, voids uh, repairs and the day-to-day -day repairs. And we recognize the time and costs of the 10 pilot properties were higher you know, than we would, uh, than could be achieved if we got into a proc different procurement and the repairs processes were more refined to deliver at scale. We chose to test the model with bed sits and what bedrooms to give us an indication of the slower churn and post repairs, uh, post let repairs in the first year. As a considerable number of these properties turn over more than once in 12 months in our, in our stock. This would help us to project the reduced service demand that may be possible in the long term. We also chose to track average arrears of the group compared to the wider tenant profile to see how much the model reduced overall debt levels. Our proposal was in 2020 rather, to scale the pile up to 300 properties and we budgeted a million pounds. But like everything, stopped and halted when the pandemic came uh, as we turned to focus on protecting and delivering core services. But by June, as part of our recovery planning, we agreed to start a much reduced second pilot. This began in October 2020 and, cost, and consisted of 71 bed sits and one beds with a budgeted cost around about 255,000. And this year in 2021, as I mentioned previously, we hope to deliver a, a larger third pilot consisting of 250 properties, spending around about 750,000. We believe this should significant, this is a significant sample to test out our wider assumptions. And again, we'll be monitored to gain greater data on the satisfaction and costs to make sure that it informs our business case going forward if we're to take this um, for all our voids. As part of our post-COVID review, we also refined our, refined our service offer to try and better understand what particular fresh start elements drove improvement costs and customer satisfaction so that the data was more robust when making future investment decisions. The initial, the initial feedback that we got from the first 10 pilot units about what the elements they most valued were mixed, so it was very difficult to draw out what people valued the most. So we decided to collapse um, the specifications and created two specifications. Uh, and focus on these. The first was uh, specification one, which we was part of our costly essentials that consisted of a new kitchen, appliances, new flooring throughout, and retained the second um, specification called Looks Great that concentrated on the property being freshly decorated with new flooring but didn't have any appliances. And we just dropped the all in where you've got everything. The key assumption we wanted to test was the 8% 8, 8 reduction in churn. With, uh, with a combined with a, ne a zero net effect on the void performance with any increased void time being offset in the reduction in lettings time. All the total investment covers all the direct costs, including a dedicated voids team for the duration of the testing. And there again are on the slides. So I'll just briefly give you about how this was delivered. Uh, again, mentioned it was focused on our one beds and bed sits in Coventry, which were difficult to let. We decide what specification uh, is going when, uh, which work stream it's going to go in when the notice is received. The properties are advertised with a fresh start photo on the choice based letting systems. We undertake our normal list, shortlisting, pre tenancy, and sign up process. Uh, but the properties are flagged on our housing management system so, to enable us to run the quantitative data. In addition, we do surveys are completed at key touch points, for example, at viewing, at settling in minutes to capture and support the collection of the uh, qualitative data, uh, data. As well in designing the larger pilots, we considered the potential risks of this initiative slowing our void turnaround and impacting on performance. And we have, and we will continue to take an agile approach by scal scaling up and down the voids entering the pilot. So it's not to destabilize our overall relet performance. Uh, just to give you an example, the fresh start properties are currently running at 16.9 repair days to complete compared to an average of 15.4 days for a non-fresh start property. So while there is a slight impact, this is well within our original target of 23 days. Another risk is the pilot area is that, you know, our data is really not going to be in a, in a good place until August um, 2021, as this will be six months after the final work, all the works and people have moved in. Uh, and this will obviously cross over into our larger scale. So our, our assessments will be ongoing and our ev evaluation will be ongoing. I'm now going to quickly show you some slides, and I won't stand, stand on them very long. The first is our costly essentials, 
a bit of a before and after. And this was the new pilot specification one. The second was our looks great, uh, which was freshly decorated with, with new flooring uh, throughout, which is our specification two. And finally, it was just the all in, which we decided no longer to test that because we couldn't get the data to support uh, the evaluation. I quickly wanted to touch base about what we're man, uh, measuring. Our, 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 start again, our evaluation is linked to three areas. The first is how Fresh Start in, improves, is improving the lives of our customers. For example, will they be financially better off? Will their mental health improve? Will they be more satisfied with their home? We are trying to capture quality data through the customer journey by observation, by conservation, by conservation, and to capture signals and behavior change. But however, it's been really difficult to keep participants engaged. Our other tests are focused on the quantitative measures relating to our business challenges, how technically feasibly and how commercial it is for citizens to deliver this at scale. Can the higher upfronts really be part funded by driving future cost savings from reduced rent loss due to shorter void periods, less turnover, less void repairs, etc.? Early results have shown fresh start turnover is better at zero compared to con the control groups of properties at 6%. So we help, we're not seeing the, the, the turnover as we are in other groups. Average repairs uh, post elect are slightly higher at 4.2 per property compared to 3.7 in the non fresh start properties. So, uh, so far it has had no effect on arrears with equal amounts of both groups being um, in arrears. But again, this data is all very um, movable as, as we, we, we roll into the full evaluation going on. So finally, I just wanted to just tell you about the challenges uh, that we faced. As with all uh, large projects, you need a passionate individual. And our passionate individual was our, uh, who originally championed Kate's um, um, fresh start at Citizen was Kate Still, who was then our uh, chief operating officer. And Kate was instrumental in, in his working with and identifying what if to, again, to devise the, the project. Again, you know, as, any, as, you, as colleagues will um, appreciate, the project did command significant commitment from key staff. And often we were taking the best and the brightest away from our other work. And similarly, we're, the way of, uh, of the uh, what if work meant that we had to work at pace in a very different way. Uh, and this again took staff from their operational um, roles. We, had, we also hadn't factored in the um, unexpected unplanned pan pandemic that meant that we had to reassess, regroup to deliver the project during lockdown. And this created an artificial break that temporarily meant we had to scale back our ambitions. We were clear that we wanted our uh, uh, to protect our mainstream performance, as I mentioned, uh, and, um, and therefore we, are, we, we created a dedicated voids team rather than fitting it in with the usual work of the voids teams. And this is not only to, it was to ensure um, delivery, but it also inevitably is, is increased costs and over time, we need to understand if we can better integrate that into the existing processes that actually reduces those additional costs. Our determination is to be able to demonstrate the effective effectiveness with sound evidence. So we want to be able to say that it's a real business case. It's not just the, the, the tug on the heartstrings, but this has proved to be a real challenge that has made even harder due to COVID. Trying to keep residents engaged over a period of time has been and continues to be challenging, even when we've offered incentives. As I said, our first formal evaluation of the pilot stages is due for completion by the end of May 2021. We believe this new model potentially provides the organisation with a significant improvement in our core product offer, which will drive improvement in the experience for our customers. We recognise that this model is expensive and any future model will require a range of investment to make it viable. The further development of the pilot presents the opportunity to test out our assumptions at scale in a more controlled way, and hopefully to eventually bring this standard to all our relet re properties. So that's all I wanted to tell you. So thank you uh, for listening. And I think we're going to move back to Vicky. Thank you, Peter. That was really, really interesting. Lots and lots of um, facts to take on board. And I think it's you know really interesting how you've backed everything up with you know qualitative qualitative research. Um, so and it's it's still ongoing so we've got a few minutes left to um take some questions um if anyone has any questions to ask of claire or or peter um then uh please far away uh 
I, I suppose I, I was interested in the service charge issue, really. And uh, um, our new stock is generally assured, uh, um, sorry, affordable rent, where the service charge is included in the in the package. And clearly, if you increase the service charge, you'd you'd reduce the rental income. And I wonder if that was a factor uh, that affected the, the, the evaluation of the um, furniture poverty um, program uh, with uh, Claire or, or with Peter's assessment of what you could provide in a, in a, in a void. Um, shall I jump in, uh, David? So from, from, from the work that we've done, um, yes, of course, the benefit cap needs to be taken into account and it needs to be, um, the service charge needs to be set at a level that's, that's acceptable to uh, DWP. Um, however, there are many, many successful FT schemes running around the country and certainly all of the ones that we've spoken to have found that, uh, you know, a clear conversation with local benefits teams at the outset does, has worked for them. They, they tend to be long-standing schemes, so they've been running for a long time and they sort of know what they're doing. I think with any scheme, it's important to look at how quickly you want to cover those capital costs. I think if you're looking to cover those capital costs in a year, that that's, that's too quickly and you're going to try and set the service charge too high. Anything from three to five years seems to work very well. The service charge seems to be at a level that, 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 that is acceptable, but we know there is this somewhat of a postcode lottery um, and um, if there's anything we can do to support RSLs who are having issues with the local benefits teams, we'll do what we can uh, in the conversations we're having with the DWP. But it's certainly not a, a, an issue for those RSLs that are running successful and long-standing FT schemes. And there are other options to provide furniture. Um, renting furniture is an option. Uh, leasing furniture, all of which can help to spread the costs and bring that service charge down. Thanks, Claire. Um, we have a, a question from um, Elaine Wilkinson from Southway, um, probably for Peter. Um, do you, did you work with a particular pro provider for white goods? Um, and also, have you looked at uh, credit unions supporting a scheme? Um, we did work with um, a specific provider and we have worked, we looked at the furniture um, research project too. One of the issues that um, we, just to centering and it's connected with what David was talking about, uh, we we done it, took extensive legal um, advice around service charge, uh, the service charge and the benefit element, and um, that's what made us decide that in our first initial um, ten and the, the subsequent seventy that we haven't we've gifted the the goods and our two hundred the next this year what we're looking to do and part of the project team are focusing is is, is the white goods element um, deliverable through the service charges and, and is it recoverable. Uh, and that hasn't really been tested and that's one of the gaps uh, that we um, haven't been able to substantiate and that's further work that's going to take place this year. I think Ben may be on the call who's, on, who's leading, who's our head of innovation, who's leading the project and I don't know whether Ben's got any, anything further that he can give but I know that's our, our priority going forward this year. Ben are you there? <laughs> We, we've actually been working with Ben and I know that FRC, I think FRC is, is the supplier of, of your white goods, which is part of our, our wider group. Um, and we'll continue to support how we can as we will with any other, anyone else who wants to get in touch. Just to fill the silence as much as anything else. <laughs> um, I don't think Ben is, is on the call actually. Um, just seeing if we've got any more questions. Does anyone else have any? I, I don't think we can use the the reactions thing. It doesn't. I, I can see it in my um, my box, but not in not in anyone else's. So if anyone wants to type any a last question into the the chat, um, then we might have a, a, a minute or two to to take that before we wrap up. Oh. There's a, there's a question in there, Vicky, from Sylvia, about what do you do if the items are not looked after? Oh, yeah. Do you automatically replace or recharge? 
I know that this 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 is a, an issue that that is a great concern, understandably so, to RSLs. As you know, obviously the RSL owns the furniture; they're putting it into the property. What happens if it's damaged or sold or whatever? We genuinely have found that this is rare. It, it, it's not a regular occurrence. Um, of course, we've asked the question of those RSLs, um, and they've said that you know, obviously they'll look at the particular circumstances within the home. Obviously, wear and tear um, is is understandable and items do need replacing after a certain period of time but um one in particular that we spoke to said that they they do recharge thank you um anyone else <laughs> definitely was trying to ask a question i think Vivi. beverly Oh, question question for Peter. And um, what do citizen um, do with goods that are left behind by a customer when they move out? Are these recycled or gifted? So far, you'd be happy to report our, on our pilots. No one's left um, so far. So we haven't, we haven't been faced with, with, with that, either the dilemma of furniture being broken or distressed or um, having to recycle. But we would look to... Um, Again, um, you're not going to um, recondition or enable the next tenancy going in to have the benefit of those goods. Oh, Beverly, I think you can un unmute. I've unmuted you, Beverly. No, she's. <laughs> um. I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I think Beverly wanted to ask a question, so I've unmuted her, but um we can all hear oh, her. We, we oh, there I can hear her, yeah. Oh hi Beverly. Fire away. No. I think Beverly's frozen. <laughs> The joys, the joys of Zoom. Oh, um, we can hear Beverly, uh, Vicky. Okay. We can definitely hear her, yeah. Yeah. So if she keeps going, I think that will be fine. Beverly, did you have a question? Yeah. Yes. Carry on, Beverly. Or Beverly, you could type your question in the chat if you like. Vicky, I think somehow you're not hearing what we're hearing. Oh, okay. I can't hear it. Ah, right. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> technical, technical hitches, technical joys. I think. Um, well, it, it's uh, just after twelve now, anyway. So um, I think probably. Um, we may need to start um, wrapping up. Beverly has said she's going to email email the presenters her questions. So hopefully, um, Peter and Claire, you'll be able to answer that um, after the meeting. So um, thank you very much for what um, has been a really, really um, insightful um, workshop. Um, you know, there's lots to take on board. And as I said, I will be sending out the presentations to everyone um, and uploading them onto our um, Homes for Cathy website in case anyone else um, within your organisation um, wants to have a look at them. Um, do look out for any other um, Homes for Cathy events. We're trying to, trying to run sort of one event a, a month, really, looking at various... Uh, you know, the commitments and, and various aspects of the commitments. Um, so yeah, do do keep coming along, um, and then we look forward to to welcoming you to to future events. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Thanks for organising it all, Vicky. Thank you, and thanks, thanks to everyone. David as well. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Claire. <laughs>